and welcome to Vital Open Science 2020. Today's webinar is called, Are We Eating Plastic? First of all, we want to thank Vital Foundation for this opportunity and also to you who are watching us. My name is Elia and I'm going to be this webinar's moderator. Here beside me we have Ricardo. He is the founder of Bioc and he's a biotechnologist and science communicator and also a promoter of the citizen science and community science movement. Good morning. Good morning, Elia. Thank you so much for the introduction. Well, Elia is part of the Bioc team. She is part of the communication team in Bioc. And yes, we're talking about a really relevant, very important topic today, yeah, very. which is plastic pollution, and especially how this plastic pollution can affect human health. So um, I'm really glad that we have the opportunity. We want to thank Vital Foundation for allowing us to perform, to um, do these webinars for the schools in, in the in Alaba um, region. And um, yeah, the, let's go, let's do it. Yeah, first of all, we want to talk a bit about Vital Foundation. It was created to promote culture and communication of science, technology and sports. And together with BIOC, we have created this innovative program called Vital Open Science 2020, aimed at the schools of Alaba. So now, we're going to talk about BIOC and who will do it better than the founder. Well, BIOC is a non-profit association that wants to promote um, citizen science. Basically, the idea is that we want to make it easy for anyone to do science, to do experiments, yeah. to do science projects. Um, what for? Well, for educational purposes, we think that the best way to, um, to learn science is by doing science, but also uh, to have fun, of course. Yeah, of course. And to combine science with other topics like, I don't know, art or, or architecture or design or who knows. And, and basically, we have, mm, mm, our foundation um, are several international movements, such as Open Science, do-it-yourself biology and uh, or community biology and citizen science. Today we're going to be talking about these movements a little bit more but we have a short video that is going to explain us what is do-it-yourself biology or community biology. La biología do-it-yourself do It Yourself Bio es un movimiento internacional de ciencia ciudadana que trata de crear una versión accesible y distribuida de la biología a través de soluciones tecnológicas de bajo coste y mayoritariamente al exterior de los entornos convencionales de la biología. Muchos de los practicantes no poseen una formación académica en esta ciencia, sino que adquieren sus nociones y las practican gracias al apoyo de la comunidad. So, Ricardo, well, uh, yes, we are earlier with eating plastic. Now, the question is how much plastic are we eating and how does it affect yeah, very or important. does it affect our health? But listen to this. Humans, we are eating approximately five grams of plastic per week. Depends on the study, but, but among between two, three weeks, one week and four weeks, we uh, eat as much as five grams of plastic. Well, that's the, a lot. That is a lot. Yeah. That is a lot. And th that's equivalent to a credit card. So this is the amount of plastic that is going into, into our bodies. Um, let me tell you a short story. Um, a few years ago, I was in Barcelona and I was eating in, at a restaurant and suddenly I found this on, on my steak. I was really surprised. That, is, that was the first time that I started to think about plastics, plastic ingestion, and how plastic ingestion can be, um, have an effect on our health. Until then, I never thought about it. Today, there is many articles about this, and there is news about plastic pollution and how plastics are getting into our bodies. But at the time, there wasn't. And you know, I, was, I was very surprised finding this. But you obviously didn't eat it. No, I, I, of course I didn't eat it, and I complained to, to, um, to the waiter, but um, you know, he says like, oh, okay, well, there's no problem with that. Um, in any case, if you look at it, you, wow. you can see that the tip is burned. Yeah, it is. So when this, this was in the fire, obviously the burn part, um, you know, it's, it's, it's pouring whatever it, that's made of into, into the, the, the meat, so possibly I was 
I was eating some some burned plastic, you know. Um, yeah, so here we have two photographs taken by Greg Siegel, a photographer from California. And by these pictures, he wants to conscious us of the amount of plastic we consume in only one week. Yeah, I do suggest that you check uh, Greg's uh, website because the, he has these amazing photographs. So one interesting thing that we see here, we see families, we see people um, at, in, in the environment. So we see, basically, it also shows us how much plastic they consume, how much trash they produce. We can see also that with time we are producing more and more uh, uh, plastic pollution, more and more plastic trash. It's quite shocking. It is quite shocking. And the fact is that when we see it in the environment, we start to understand that most of this trash is going to end up in our environment. And that, as you see in the photograph, the health of that environment and our health is the same thing. Yeah, we are not separated are. from the environment. So what, what, what are we seeing here? We see in here that a lot of, of these products that end up in the environment, for example, you know, large plastic like this, they end up becoming microplastics. Yeah, really small. So a smaller size plastics, they become smaller and smaller and smaller and these products, these plastic products, can end up in our body. The same with plastics like this. Because of the erosion, because of the heat, because of the, um, um, well, the UV light, this ends up becoming tiny pieces of plastic, and these are going to end up in our bodies. Also, one single use, a plastic products. We please ask everyone to avoid using one single use plastic products yeah, such as this because we use them only one single time. I mean if you have yeah. a, a plastic in, uh, in your building is made of, of plastic mm. but that that building is going to last for ages yeah. or but for these me. products are going to end up in the trust in the in the environment and this is very dangerous. So how do we know that we're ingesting so much plastic? Well, the scientists know because they've been checking human feces. So they check the poo from, uh, you know, from humans at different places in, around the world, and they find, most of the time, they find plastics in human feces. Most of the plastic that we ingest is going through our body and it's going to go out, but some of it... Will stay. Might stay, yes. So we will look at that later. Sad. But if we look at the, the, the plastic recycling codes and the microplastics that are found in human feces, we can see a correlation here between plastics like, like PP and PET, which are the most present. But pretty much every type of plastic that is being produced, we know that are ending up in our body because scientists have been finding them in human feces. So are these microplastics in our food? Well, the, the, the question is, yeah, how, how yeah. do they get into yeah. our body, yeah? yeah? They are in our food, they are in our water, um, they are in our drinks. And if you can see here, this is about particles, um, um, microplastic particles that we consume per week. This is also an average, this is also a study done by scientists. And we see that most of the particles are in the water. But we also see many of many particles in fish, mm -hmm. shellfish, and seafood. Those of us that love seafood, well, we are in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> also salt. Salt contains um, a lot of microplastics. And for example, those of us that, us that also like beer, um, also in trouble because um, we can find about 10 particles per week of microplastics in beer. So there is a correlation between these and water? Yes, there is a correlation between this and water because most of the plastics that are not being recycled are going to end up in landfills, but eventually they're going to end up in the oceans. Yeah. So there is a huge accumulation of plastics in the ocean. Think about this. Scientists are predicting that by 2030 there could be more the plastic in the sea that we find in the sea could weigh more than all the fish in the sea, which is um, pretty scary. Yeah. But he, 
in 10 years. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, here we can see how these plastics end up in the oceans, in the sea. You know, from once we have things like um, synthetic fibers, you know, most of the clothes we buy. Yeah, from our clothes. Yeah, they are polyester mm -hmm. or they are synthetic fibers. These fibers, when we wash them, they release, they are being released, they go into the water, into the sewage, and end up quite often in the oceans, ocean. lakes, rivers, etc. Also from the tires in the cars. The friction of the tires on the cars is releasing many microplastics that are going to end up in the sea as high percentage. But we also see that, you know, dust from the cities, uh, um, paints, um, also uh, coating for, for um, ships and so on. And also a small percentage is coming from beauty products, you know, like nail, um, painting the nails, um, also sunscreen, yeah. um, a glitter, and, so, and toothpaste. It, so it's everywhere, really. Actually, microplastics, these are called primary microplastics. They, they are produced by industry and they are sold in the products that we buy. Quite often beauty products. So here we'll suggest to avoid buying, yeah. buying avoid products it. because it's not necessary to have these microplastics in beauty products. So um, we do suggest avoid buying this. But we do have a video to oh. that is very interesting. Well, we have spoken to uh, Charlie. He is a marine biologist. And we had this really interesting conversation with Charlie he um, is going to explain us much better what is the situation of plastic pollution in the oceans. Let's watch the video. So to talk, to, to talk about plastic pollution, we have with us Charlie um, Gabori. Charlie is finishing his PhD at the Institute of Marine Sciences in Barcelona. Um, he's also a diving instructor he has participated in educational and conservational projects around the world, um, such as mapping corals and so on. Um, and he's also a marine biology teacher, um, other than a scientist. And um, hello, Charlie. Thank you for being with us. Hello. Thanks, Ricardo. Um, so uh, first question, how did you become a marine uh, biologist? That's a good question, actually. Um... I started doing medical schools. I was diving since I'm a child, so I really love the sea. I just spend my time in the sea. And I started doing medical school and I was just seeing all my friends uh, here doing biology, going on the field, having nice stuff to see and everything. I was like, ah, I don't want to keep going on medical school. It's what I want to do. So after two years of medical school, I just stopped and I went to do a bachelor degree in, in biology, in terrestrial biology. And for my last year, I moved to Norway, to uh, North Pole, and there all studies are about fisheries and Arctic biology. And I started doing a lot of marine science, like about seals, about fisheries, about everything like my plastic in fish, all of this kind of thing. And I was like falling in love with what I was doing and I was just, I want to keep going. So I looked for a master's degree and I found a master's degree that was doing everything in the sea that you can see like physics chemistry and biology so that was the most interesting for me it's just to play with everything that i have around me and i went to this master degree and i start to focus myself about microorganisms and all the micro stuff you can find as uh, plastic for example and uh, ending my master degree i went to spain for a master internship where i work on on a time series and mostly on phytoplankton productions and plastics inside fish during a long time series that was a 10 years time series. And I was like, ah, I can't stop there. I have to keep going. And I went to do a PhD that I found in collaboration with some university around the world and mostly Barcelona. And I start working here more about uh, effect of human perturbation and human natural perturbation on phytoplankton and diversity and how it can impact the food web and of course coming back to human health. All right, so this brings us to, to, to the next question. Um, can you really be briefly um, tell us in a couple of lines what is your research about and how does it relate to plastic pollution? 
Sure, sure. Um, as I told you just before, I was just working on phytoplankton a lot, and that's my main study, actually. I'm working about all currents, all perturbation can affect phytoplankton diversity and can affect the ecosystem. But indirectly, all my studies, I work with microplastics. Like I started doing my bachelor degree with this fish ring, uh, studies in Norway and after I went to uh, to Spain when I did my master degree and I work also with how oh, it can impact in the long term way like the, the fish and the long term way uh, how it can be found plastic and then it will disappear or not and uh, also right now it's I, I, I have been focused on the interesting way that plastic is the same size than phytoplankton most of the time uh, organism doesn't know and they feed on them they just feed as much plastic as they can feed phytoplankton. Mm -hmm. So depending on the area of your research, you will have a lot of uh, plastics and this will have a huge impact of, from the microorganisms to the bigger organisms and coming back, of course, by cons consume, consume, consuming to the human health. So that was my main focus, like to understand how like uh, in the global ocean, plastic from Mexico can take a current like the Gulf Stream coming back to Europe and impact Europe, European coast or how a big city as Barcelona, for example, will reject a lot of plastics and all people eat fish next to the beach. So how, what will be the correlation here? So that's why, where I went on my studies and what I want to be doing. And I have also another indirect study that I was doing about trolling studies. It's meaning that taking samples from the bottom and how bigger plastic can impact like uh, ecosystems such as corals, such as Posidonia, because they get trapped uh, inside, they like organisms cannot feed, organisms cannot move. And this also is a huge problem for ecosystems. So for the productions and it will impact on economies and human activities, of course. Sure. So we, we already seen a lot of publications and, and you know, your research probably showing also um, the, the impact uh, on the on the life and on the health of ecosystems and living organisms. Um, what about humans? Uh, is, is the situation um, as bad as it seems? Um, what do we know about the impact on, on humans? Um, can you tell us about this? Actually, it's very good questions because, you know, we know short impact, but we don't know long term impact. And as I told you before, but the crazy things to me, it's like you can know nothing about five years, 10 years, but what will happen in 50 years? What will happen when you produce a medicament and in 50 years you have an impact on human health and you create a cancer? So that's very interesting here right now there's some studies that say no there's not impact like there's a really really interesting studies that i read about that's from esther garrido but mm -hmm. she thought she directly told you can consume as much as shellfish or as fish that you can but this will not be impact uh in human health mm -hmm. I, I agree with that it's like you cannot fight find a direct impact but uh lastly there were a lot of studies on hormones for example Mm -hmm. And we could see that uh, plastic have impact of human hormones. There is more and more younger girls that, for example, that complain about hormones problem mm -hmm. since they are child and much younger. There is a lot of uh, men also that have like hormones problem. There's like a lot of humans person that have new hormones problem. And this can come from, they form the relationship with plastics. So there is a lot of interesting stuff like that. And also when you hit plastic, of course, there is a, like a stress for the organism. We have seen it with fish. There is a stress. You can pro, uh, your organism will produce a response to that. Some organisms, to respond to that, will just kill the cells. That we call uh, tumor cells. And the tumor cells, if you have too much in a long time, you will have like a cancer, for example. And this can be observed probably in human in 10, 20, 30 years. We don't know about that because it's something new. And we produce more and small, small and small plastics that we don't see. So that's all these small plastic will impact your organisms that will be interesting to study in the long term. So there's plenty of stuff. For example, 20% um, of all the Mediterranean Sea, of 20% uh, of all the plastic in the entire ocean is found in the Mediterranean Sea. And in Europe, you have like, I think the fish consumption from Mediterranean Sea in Europe is more than half of all the fish consumption that, the, that people are doing. Mm -hmm. So that's crazy. If you find as much plastic here, all can come back in an indirect way to the human health, or it can impact us. So that will be an interesting question that we have to look further and we have to understand because it's not a short-term study, but a long-term study. Certainly. I think that um, obviously environment has no borders. 
and we are part of the ecosystems and mm -hmm. definitely um, the impact on the ecosystem and on the health of the ecosystem is going to be the impact on our health. Um, so definitely there is a lot more research to, to be done uh, to define how this is affecting our hormones. If it has, you know, some toxics present in, in plastics are also uh, inducing cancer and so on that, as you mentioned. Um, now, one question about your work uh, with the schools and students, we know that you're doing some, some work with students. Can you tell us a little bit about this experience with the schools? Sure. Actually, this it was a in, really interesting thing. It's like I, I start to work with high schools, you, you, usually like American high school and French high school, because they do a lot of this, you know, this science fair project that they have to present at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And at some point, a student just came to me and it's like, oh, can you help me with this project? I'd like to work about the sea. I was like, OK, let's do that. We can do uh, like something about microplastic and look all this microplastic yeah, that you will find just in the sun uh can change between season and he found like he did the experiment so much that he liked it so much that he, he did it during two years in a row but he has to do it only for one year so that was crazy and the, and after was very crazy because we really see that plastics from the distance between the sea and uh, the shore it's really depend the change the type of plastic and it will depend the impact you will have in the sea and the impact that you will have in the shore and uh this this student make me like, oh, they have to look further more. So like, okay, can I use your results for scientists also to present it to scientists? And so I said, oh, that's a really interesting thing. Why? Because I really think that small impact, small work that can do students can have a bigger, bigger impact later. So I start to do the same project with more and more students. And there's like some student that asked me about, oh, I like informatics. So I want to do models. So, okay, let's do models between prey uh, like between fish, for example, and microplankton, uh, microplankton and see how it works, how they hit each other. And they found an interest and they get passionate about that. And I have, for example, my first student now that he's doing a bachelor degree in biology because he liked the project he had done. So that's the thing that interests me and motivates me just to see all these young students and young person getting an interest, getting one about what occurs and want to go to look for what happened to have some responses and that's the most great thing because smaller things that you can use you can have bigger impact because after you present it in the scientist community so every everybody's impacted by that so it's really interesting yeah and i like that um what you mentioned about asking students um what they like um and then trying to find a way to uh, connect their interests their personal interests maybe in computer science, for example, with the possibilities on research, um, in this case, on, on, on biotech or on, on marine biology and so on. I think it's, 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 it's the right approach. Well, just to finish with this um, really interesting conversation, um, I wanted to ask you, um, this is what we ask every guest. Do you have uh, any message you want to share with teachers and students? Just keep going, just keep going. It's like there's an entire world to discover. That's the amazing thing of science. I, you know nothing, actually, you know nothing of what is going on under the sea. You know nothing of what will be the huge impact on human. So that's interest, that curiosity should just put yourself to go further, to go more and to want more. And don't stop because you don't find any project, because you don't find any money, because you don't find now, because at some point you will always find something if you really like what you are doing. And for me, that's the most interesting thing to do. Fantastic, Charlie. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Thank uh, you very much. And take care and keep on working with um, um, to find out the long the long term effects of, of microplastics and nanoplastics. Thanks. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, so Charlie is talking about the pollution in the Mediterranean, but what about in the Basque Country? Well, actually there is a very recent study that shows the, the pollution is also present in our coast. This study, led by um, Cristina Peña uh, from the University of the Basque Country, has shown that um, half of the sediments and water samples analyzed from our Bay of Biscay area coast also contain plastics and microplastics. That's a lot. That is a lot. And not only it's found in the environment, but also it's found within the living organisms. Here we have a beautiful photograph of Daphnia. 
Daphnia is a microscopic crustacean. Um, very interesting because it has a, a, the exoskeleton of Daphnia is translucent, so you can see through it. And they have done some studies of growing Daphnia with plastic beads present in the water. And here in the image, on the right side of the image, you can see in green, the green points, these are microplastic beads that are being accumulated in Daphnia, not only in the digestive system, but also in other organs. So you've said we are eating these plastics, but are we also breathing them? Not only we're eating plastic, but microplastics and nanoplastics, even smaller particles of plastic, are present in the air. And they are present in other organisms, um, such as birds and so on. But there is a recent study that shows this, the amount of microplastics present in the sky of Madrid. And obviously, if these microplastics and nanoplastics are present in the, in the atmosphere, then we are breeding them. Not only we're breeding them, we also know by some um, studies that some of these plastics that we are breeding are causing inflammation in our respiratory system, in our lungs. And in what other ways is it having an impact in our health? Well, we don't know that much about the impact that plastics, microplastics and nanoplastics are having in our health. We do know that they're causing inflammation of our airways. We also know from studies in, in cell culture within the lab, you can culture cells, brain cells, lung cells, liver cells. When um, adding microplastics to the culture medium, we saw toxicity. We see that those cells die, those, those cells are in trouble. What else? We also see that some plastic associated pollutants, because plastics also contain some highly toxic products. They are made with highly toxic products. And they have an effect in, 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 in sexual function, fertility, in the, in the hormone levels in our bodies. They can induce mutations and they can produce inflammation. And mutations often are the origin, mutations are gonna be the origin of cancer. So this we know from animal studies. And it's likely that something like this could be also happening to humans. So this is really worrying. Well, it is really worrying. However, um, we know from a study at the, uh, uh, done by the University Autonoma of Barcelona that many of these toxic products that are contained in plastics are present in humans. They could be found in urine, they have been found in blood. But World Head Health Organization also has shown so far the studies that have been done they show that doesn't seem there's a, there's not a correlation there is no uh, doesn't seem to be a health issue um, that the current levels of microplastics we are drinking or oh. ingesting doesn't seem to be a problem this is good news yeah it is good news however um, a lot more research is de needed and like Charlie said we need long-term research. We need to see what are the long-term effects of plastics. Not easy, because sometimes it's not easy to know the difference between the toxicity of plastics and other common pollutants, like you know, polluted air from, from cars or, or industry contamination, um, or maybe pesticides, or who knows, many other pollutants that are present in the environment. And how can we help scientists? Well, um, I like this question. There is a possibility for us also to help scientists in this, in this work. And actually, we have one of the major um, um, studies being done in the world. It's being done in Indonesia, mm -hmm. because it's one of the countries with the highest amount of plastic pollution. Um, and this is a photograph from um, Plastic China. A beautiful documentary that I do recommend you watch it to understand the global issue surrounding plastics and especially the issue in developing countries or countries like, like China. But how can we help scientists? Well, we can help scientists through citizen science projects. And I want to show you a video, a short video about a project that is called 
adventure scientist. Any one of us can be an adventure scientist. And for example, we can help them by collecting samples for them to study. Let's watch the video and let's understand better how this Sounds works. Fun. Five years ago, we scooped up a half liter of water locally, brought it back to the institute. Looking under the microscope and seeing all these technicolored pieces of plastic led me to think of all of these larger questions. How is it affecting the ocean? Our drinking water, our microplastics everywhere? But I couldn't answer those on my own. So this is when I partnered with adventure scientists. Adventure Scientists is a nonprofit organization that unites explorers and scientists to solve some of the world's most pressing environmental issues in which access to data is crucial to resolving them. I worked with adventure scientists to train adventurers who would be collecting data for me around the world. I'm about to take a microplastic sample. I was able to get water samples from the Antarctic and the middle of the Pacific. We're gonna send this into the labs. Through the process of working with adventure scientists, I was getting closer to understanding the magnitude of this issue. After analyzing thousands of samples from around the world, we concluded that 74% of them contain microplastic pollution. Microplastics are one of the largest pollution problems that you've never seen. Without adventure scientists, I would have never been able to even dream about this breadth of data that I've been able to collect. The adventure scientist model lends itself to so many different projects, whether it be microplastics or forestry conservation or animal protection. This is just the beginning. So as we could see, Adventure Scientist is a typical uh, citizen science project, or in this case, it's an organization that helps scientists develop citizen science projects. In this case, people from around the world, adventurous people that travels to you know, faraway places, they send water samples to be analyzed. So that's a way that we can help. You know, we can send samples. Um, it doesn't have to be from Antarctica. It could be from the local river or pond. Yeah, near here. Or the coast near here or a lake near your house. Mm. So we can participate in that way. But there is other ways that we can do it. We can. And for example, here we have two interesting examples of youth just like you helping in the solve or helping reduce the impact of plastics. From one side, we have here on the left, Fionn Ferreira. He is the winner of the Google Challenge, um, presenting a scientific method in order to reduce, reduce plastics in the oceans. He is very young. Very young, 18 years old, with a beautiful project. Check it out. Um, he also won 50,000 US dollars. Wow. And here we have two girls that they started a campaign in Indonesia. These two girls were seeing so much plastic pollution that they started the campaign Bye Bye Plastic Bags. And this had a huge impact. They have a TED, TED talk, TED presentation. You can watch it for free. Just write this Bye Bye Plastic TED talk in Google and you will find this. It's a beautiful presentation about the project. We definitely recommend you watch it. We didn't have enough time to show it here. But please take a look at this because we can see the huge impact two girls can have on the, um, on the, well, on the problem of plastic pollution.
Yeah. So every little counts. Definitely. And here from here we recommend that you also join the youth because there is a lot of uh, movements um, starting here also in Alaba, in the Basque Country and around movements led, led by young people that are want to tackle the environmental problems. So please, um, we suggest that we do join, participate in these movements. Now, what can we do to reduce plastic pollution and the negative impact of plastics? Well, there's a very interesting thing happening. We have something that is called brain plasticity. And I like that, you know, the word plastic plasticity. Yeah. So plasti brain plasticity means that our brain is able to change, to adapt, that is very plastic. Plastic in Greek means changeable. Mm -hmm. It means that it can be modeled, it can be, it can be changed. So one thing we have to start doing is we have to start changing some consumer habits to reduce the impact. Uh, that we have in the environment, not only for plastics. One of the basic things is always said, reduce, reduce. recycle, yeah. and, and reuse. reuse. Very important. Reduce the amount of plastic you consume. Try to avoid buying products that are uh, highly packaged within plastics. Yeah. Try to avoid one single use plastic items. Yeah, because it's not necessary. It's not necessary. Another thing, try to use some products that are not made of plastic, metal, bamboo, and with this you avoid, if you carry this, I carry this all the time with me, and you avoid having to use plastic spoons for a single use and having to throw them away when you go to a restaurant or, uh, you know, take away and so on. It's really very easy to take this with you. Very easy to take this with you because it's very lightweight and this is for example a straw made of bamboo. So in this case what you avoid is using one single use straw and then throwing it because it's going to end up in the oceans and it's going to end up inside of our body. And finally another thing that we can do, here we can see um, they're serving coffee in, in a cup that is compostable. This cup okay. It's made of um, bioproducts, it's, it's, it's biomaterial, so it's not plastic and it's compostable. So it's going to go into the land and it's going to be part of the, of the land. Microbes are going to eat it and it's going to become fertilizer for the soil. So one thing we can do is we can tell, for example here, this airplane company had complaints from some of the passengers Okay. And they decided to change from plastic cups to compostable cups. So we can talk to our local supermarkets, to our local shops, we can talk to um, local institutions. Um, those places where we consume and we find excess plastic, and we can tell them, we would like you to move from plastic to something that is biodegradable, compostable, and try to reduce the amount of plastic. So it's something that we can do we can change our habits and we can start inducing this change also in the companies and in, in you know, those shops and those institutions that are selling the products. So it's in our hands to change this? It is definitely in our hands to change this. By changing our behavior, yeah. our brain plasticity is going to allow us to change that behavior and to get used to new behaviors but also by being a bit tough on these institutions and asking them please to start removing plastics. This is already happening, but we have to manage, we have to make it happen faster. However, there is also science and technology helping us to reduce plastic pollution. For example, on this image we can see on the top left, we can see these tiny worms yeah. Well, scientists have found that these worms and other organisms, especially bacteria, uh, microorganisms, have the capacity to ingest plastic. Really? Yeah. So it's and not toxic for them? It's not toxic for them. For them, it can be food. Okay. So this can be helpful to reduce plastic pollution. However, the rate of plastic consumption in, this, in these creatures is very low. So the first thing we have to do is stop 
throwing plastic away. Now, we also have here on the right, we see Materium. I suggest you check up Materium's webpage. Materium is about bioproducts, biomaterials. They have amazing workshops and a, a lot of um, possibilities for you to do um, within your school activities using compostable biodegradable materials. Um, fantastic, the possibilities that these materials, that is the future. Biology, living organisms, living systems are going to be producing all the products that are going to be substituting plastics in the near future. Then we can also see some samples where we can stop using oil, petroleum-based products. And this is not so related to plastic, but it's interesting, the sample of a bus that runs with human feces. Really? Really. So human feces and bacteria are sufficient to produce methane, and the methane is being used to move this bus. And finally, I want to mention this uh, website, um, and there is many websites of, like this one, that are going to tell us how to recycle. They're going to tell us when we have questions about, okay, so I have this, where do I throw it away? What con container does this go to? Is this recyclable, yes or no? If it's the, qu the answer is no, it's like, okay, maybe I don't want to buy products with this. Is this recyclable? Yes, this goes into the yellow container. So we, have to, we can use this, this technology, communication technology, to start changing our behavior and to be better recyclers. And to finish with this um, webinar, or the first, first part of the webinar, we would like to talk, like always, about the challenges. And here, we want to present two possible challenges, but most of all, we want you to talk to us and present to us the challenges that you think are suitable for your school, for your students, uh, and also for, your, for educators. So one possibility is let's look at all the citizen science projects. There is many citizen science projects that deal with plastic mm -hmm. pollution. Yeah. So let's check which projects we want to take part in. And with our help and help of Funda uh, yeah, Vital, Vital. Vital Foundation, we can start to implement the citizen science projects in the schools with your help. And the second possible uh, um, challenge would be how about we create a project to tackle plastic pollution. It could be a citizen science project, it can be done with scientists from the Basque Country, or it could be done something between us, just the schools um, with, together with the help of, of BIOC and Vital Foundation, we can run programs where students participate and we, we can, well, I have a few ideas, but possibly you also have some ideas. Possibly all the students have ideas. Why not, let's put these ideas together and let's develop some projects for us to be able to help reduce plastic pollution in our area. Yeah, because everything is easier if we do it all together. Definitely, with the help of scientists and the help yeah. of schools and students, and the help of Vital Foundation and the help of BIOC, we can definitely create some projects that have high impact in our environment, in our community. So these are the challenges. We want to finish uh, by saying thank you. And now there's gonna, you're going to have some time. You can ask questions. Yeah, please ask questions. Any question, you can ask questions through the chat of the YouTube channel, or you can ask questions by sending a WhatsApp to our telephone, 633-576-323. And since we have a little bit of time and we don't have, um, we, we don't have any questions so far, we would like to show a possible experiment that you guys can do. Interesting. Very easily. You can do this at school, you can do this at home. We have been doing this here um, the last couple yeah, of days. <laughs> And the thing is that we have been, um, we've gone to the fish shop and we have asked, we have bought some fish and we have asked also for the digestive system of the fish. 
important to have the digestive system from mouth to anus, the whole part, in order to see if we find also microplastics in these samples. So the same way that it has been done in different studies, the same way that scientists are doing this. You can do it. You can do it. And you don't need much. You need some filters. You need some scissors, maybe a cutter. This is basically what you need. And in order to check the samples, it would be good to have a microscope. This is a do-it-yourself microscope. And all you do is to put the samples that you get from the fish. And here you can use this microscope using your mobile phone. And you can check with your camera. You can see magnification of the sample in order to identify those plastic fibers, these microplastics. This is possibly the, the, the most difficult part of this experiment. First, the dissection is very simple. Next, to find the part of the organ, so the digestive system is quite tricky, but it's well explained in yeah. this procedure, as if, we can see here. If you're patient, you'll be able to do it. Yes, and um, basically this is the procedure you have all the steps in, the, in, in this presentation and one of the toughest parts is at the end when you have all this contents, all the contents mm -hmm. from the digestive system to identify which ones are plastic and which ones are organic because there is a lot of organic uh, like algae or pieces of you know the food that of yeah. these, these fish are eating could be algae, could be plankton, could be you know um, other fish but it's important to be able to have a microscope or a magnifying glass in order to see those samples because then you can detect which are plastics and which are not. And also the texture and the, the stiffness of, of those um, fibers can tell you if it's a plastic or if it's not. However, this, this um, is showing very, you know, showing how this is done. But we were running this experiment yesterday and the day before, the day before we found some fibers, some microplastic fibers. We made a video yesterday of the procedure. How about we watch this video so you have an idea of how the process goes. This was done with the, the whole um, intestine of a, of a large fish. Do you remember what fish was this? It was um... It was a monkfish, I think. Mon yeah, monkfish. Anyway, let's watch this, uh, let's watch this video. Okay, so today we are going to try to find uh, microplastics within the digestive system of a fish. Um, what we need, obviously, uh, we need the fish. In this case, we have all the um, organs of a monk fish, quite large, possibly about um, five kilos, maybe more. Um, we also have a guide on how to do this. This is from Civic Laboratory. It's a, everything is well explained how scientists do this procedure in their labs, but we can do it at home. Just, um, well, you can um, go to the fish uh, shop like I did and ask them for the, you know, all the um, organs, all the intestines, and especially the digestive tract from mouth to anus um, of a fish, a large fish if possible. Um, then what we need? Well, we need some cutting devices, as we see, some scissors. We also need um, uh, to pick up microplastics, um, the twi tweeters? tweezers, and we need. Uh, we can also use um, um, filters, metal filters, coffee filters, and some bowls in order to do this procedure. Um, we will need some water also in order to clean the, 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 the stomach and the intestine. And um, we also have a couple microscopes because um, since we will be looking for small plastic fibers, we might need the microscopes um, in order to identify this. We have a do-it-yourself um, microscope, low-cost microscope, we have an educational microscope we can also use a digital USB microscope that we have here in the lab. Um, so, let's go to it.
this is this is it for it uh, for today. Um, you might say, well, we are uh, we have been unlucky not to find any microplastics in this sample, but uh, to tell you the truth, uh, this is science and this is how it works. Um, you have your hypothesis. You believe that um, uh, fish, are go fish of this size are going to have some microplastics within them, but you might find after the experimental procedure that that is true or that is not true. In any case, this is a very simple procedure. Um, well, it's not that simple, but it's a, it's a procedure that you can do at home. So um, I suggest that you also try it at home and um, and after you find some um, maybe microfibers and or different plastics of different sizes if you have a microscope or a magnifying glass do check them under the glass and um, well share it share it on on, on social media uh, or or share it with us at um, bioc.org um, anytime we'll be happy to know what are your your results from this experimental procedure Thank you very much and see you next time. Okay, well, we've seen this video. Um, this is, as we said, is a very simple procedure. Yeah. We recommend you try it. You have um, in the teacher's uh, guide the link to find this. This comes from the Civic Laboratory. It's a great resource. And why not be in yourself the one that finds microplastic samples in fish? And if you do find them, please contact us. Yeah, please send us pictures. Send us photos. Yeah. You have our WhatsApp. You can send us photos. You can tell us what you found in these samples. Mm -hmm. And if you are interested in doing a challenge, a project together with us, um, checking you know, in different schools fish samples to be you know ourselves the one that find plastics and microplastics in in fish samples let's do it we'll be happy to help you um, organizing this project and and uh, doing it with um, using the scientific method properly and doing this procedure properly so you can be the scientists definitely you can be the scientist better to be the scientist than the fish in this yeah. case <laughs> All right, so thank you so yeah. much. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed this webinar. We hope that you learned. And we also hope that all of us, with this knowledge, we can start changing um, our behavior and reducing our negative impact in the environment. So that's all for today. Thank you, Fita thank Foundation. You. Thank you to all of you. And until next webinar, take care. Bye.